So I'm going to give you guys a chance to take part. We're going to do a Kahoot this morning again. And this week we're talking about um, family and work. And uh, I want to encourage you to, uh, to grab your phones, pull it out. Um, this is actually just amazing timing on how God's put things together for the special assembly and how, like, I planned this series back in last June when we would get to this point in the sermon series. And it's just amazing how God ends up having the right subjects being talked about at the exact right times because I had no idea what was going to be happening in January of 2024 other than this is the week that we're talking about family and work. So, for the Kahoot, put the uh, data in. Um, you got 20 seconds to answer each. Uh, they're pretty straightforward, although some of them might be some stats that are a surprise to you. I'm always interested in the names that come up, like potato, what? And who's Mr. Nice Guy? Because I'd like to be friends. <laughs> okay. How much longer do you think? You guys are pretty much ready? Okay. Awesome. Sorry to you online. You're always about 15 seconds behind because you get points for answering the fastest and right. So the guys online, I don't know how well you're going to do with having to wait because you only have five seconds to answer. Otherwise, you miss out. Okay. So first question. Choir man. That's good. First question. What is the proportion of couples that have children? So what I mean, how, what's the percentage of people that have children sometime in their uh, life as a couple? What's the per- percentage? 40, 60, 50, or 70 percent? Okay. 50 percent. So 50 percent of Canadian couples will have children at some point in their lifetime. Oh, Canadian couples. This is all Canadian stats, all from Stats Canada. This is from the Stats Canada website, so if you go to the Stats Canada website, you will get the correct answers. But then you won't have gotten them fast. Okay, let's go to the next one. Thank you. Oh, cutting board. That makes sense for... What is the proportion of children being raised by grandparents in Canada? 9, 12, 15, or 20 percent? These are being the primary caregiver are the grandparents. We have 9% is the actual real number, 9%. So I was a little bit surprised by that, but not too terribly. Okay, awesome. Next question. This applies to some of you living in this room right now. What is the proportion of young adults living at home ages 20 to 34? Oh, living with their parents. Living with their parents. This is from Stats Canada. These just came out only last week, actually. It is 35%. So are you surprised by that? No, I'm not. I thought it was just about exactly what I expected. I see some of the ones who have their kids living at home nodding. Oh, no, I'm joking. (laughs) Okay, sorry. Oh, VB. Wow, somebody's way out. Who stole the answers off my sheets? Oh, I know. I put my sermon out there. That's the person who had my sermon. I know it. Ah, yeah, okay, okay. Next, next question, next question. What is the number of people in Canada with a job? How many, how many millions of people? 30 million, 20 million, 10 million, or 15 million people in Canada? 40-ish, 40-ish million, just a little, right around 40 million. That means you currently have, they currently have a job. They might have had, a, that's not counting the ones who had a job retired. It is 20 million. Wow, most people got that one, right? Yep. 20 million people. Oh, okay. Catching up. There's still a chance. Peaches and cream climb the highest. What is the average weekly earnings in Canada? Some of you might make you happy when you see this. Some of you are like, wait a minute. or $1,200. The average weekly earnings in Canada. Stats Canada. Yep, yep, that's gross. That's gross. 
1,200. Again, just going off the Stats Canada website, you see these right on the front page, by the way. They're the first things from the front page. Excellent. Oh, my word. Ty, that's amazing. Wow. Okay, thank you. Awesome. What is the average wage increase in the past year? One is the Canadian average. Another one is the American average. You might be shocked. If there's only one correct answer. We're looking for the Canadian. So what did your wage increase look like this year for those who are working? Four percent. Anybody bonus points that want to say what the American one was? 6.5. Americans made more money, wage increase, than we did this year. Oh, I've got to catch those Americans. Thank you. Okay. Wow, Christine, you, you won. Where, where are you? Woohoo! Good job. Did you cheat? Or were you one of the ones that grabbed my sermon? Oh, okay. Good job. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> family and work. Everyone has a family and almost everyone works or will work or has worked. Everyone has a parent a mother or a father. You might have a great relationship with them, or you might be estranged, but we all have parents. According to Stats Canada, half of Canadians right now are working, and the vast majority will work some point in their life. All of us here that I know of, we we have some sort of work that we're engaged in, whether we're a boss or an employee. This passage talks directly about parenting and work. I'm going to ask Chris to come up and read this passage. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. It's on the overhead, but I also encourage you to have your Bibles open in front of you as we study this together. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Thank you, Chris. This is a hard passage because it is culturally a very different world that we live in than when this was written, although there's a lot of ideas and universal ideas that we can take out of. If you remember for last week's message, there's a similar pattern here for husbands and wives as there is within the family. A few assumptions that the author, Paul, is giving as we read this. The assumption is that the parents are parenting together, husband and wife, that there's two of them. I want to make it clear that in our church, we don't expect that the only way that somebody can be raised properly is is in a two-parent home. I know single moms who work really hard and, and, and do an admirable job of raising children. So in no way is this to be seen as a slight that if you are a single parent and you're striving to follow Christ and and teach his commands to your children that you're somehow inferior. We're going by the cultural expectation that at this time in history, that was an extremely rare occurrence, especially in a Greek and Roman society where um, the only way divorce happens was when a husband divorced his wife. She had really no recourse in any manner, no matter how bad it got, because in that culture that Paul was writing into, uh, the husband was really the master. And, And we don't live that way, praise God. And a big part of the reason why we don't live this way is actually directly out of Paul's teachings that actually changed society. But Paul is speaking into a society right now 
where, where this is the way it is. So that's what Paul does. He speaks into the culture right then and there. The similar pattern is also, as it was the previous week's message, there's a short period where it talks about wives, and there's a lot more teachings for the husbands. Remember what I said? There was two to eight comparatively last week. This week, it's, it's a couple of verses for the couple, and this time there's men that are picked out directly. Why? Well, Emerson Edricks, who I'm borrowing heavily from in this sermon, who is a great uh, doctor uh, of marriage and family counseling, uh, his, his book, um, have, his books have been absolutely instrumental in my understanding of, of conflict resolution in marriages. He says that there's a strong cultural mix that men needed to overcome and maybe a little bit of nature where, you know what, sometimes we guys just need to be told things direct. I don't know if that's ever seen to you, but that's the way it is for me. I need to be told things a little bit more directly because it goes over my head. I'll give you a good example. Yesterday, I went out to my parents' house. We brought part of supper, and Heather carried everything she got in the car. Didn't you notice that I carried everything? And I'm like, no, actually, I didn't. It's not in any way me trying to say, yeah, that's her job. It's like, duh. I'm going to start the car. It's cold. Right? Like, that's just the way it is. So, so there is some nature within that, but a big part of this is nurture. Nurture, what is, what are you taught? Um, men in the Greek and Roman culture, to which Paul was written here, were officially told by their culture that they had no duties in caring or raising children other than in a disciplinary role. Now, if you of the older generation, or even the current generation, have a parent, a father who is like that, I want to make this as an emphasis. That is not a biblical ideal. That is a cultural ideal that actually has its roots in Roman tradition. I've told you this before. There's other Roman traditions that we've carried on without any thought of. Who walks the bride down the aisle in most cases? The father. Why? I don't know. That's the way it's done. In Roman society, it was because the father was actually making a business transaction with the man he was giving her to. So think about that when you're planning your weddings, young people. Now, of course, we're not saying that anymore. It's not the same. Nobody's making that statement anymore within that. I'm just saying we, without knowing, still hold on to some of these same traditions. So disciplinary role was also seen to be done in a very harsh way. But, but this all comes out of that making just logical sense of how the society played out the, the way men were perceived in culture. By Roman law, by action, women and children were no different than owning a prized horse or a pet. Actually, it wasn't uncommon for men at that time to write about how they loved their horse more than their wife. This idea that Paul writes completely blows that idea up and out of the water. Men and women have different natural skill sets, but they are equal partners because they are equal before Jesus. And we have the freedom to figure out what that means. That was last week's sermon, right? Paul addresses parenting now, and he talks to the children first. He tells them the first of the Ten Commandments that are actions for us to follow, and that is honor your father and mother so it will go well for you and you will enjoy a long life here on earth. That is directly from both Exodus and Deuteronomy. This is a, it will go well for you because you will be at peace. Because that is our goal in life, is to live at peace. Now, we live in a country that has so been at peace for so long, we actually don't actually comprehend how incredibly important it is for us to live at peace. Just talk to somebody who comes from a country that is in warfare. I only understand it this much because of my friends. My friends from Congo, who I'm so near and dear to, but I've got lots of other places, but I'm closest to my friends from Congo. Congo, by the way, right now has seven million people displaced in Congo because of ongoing conflict. Every week, at least 10,000 people are dying in Congo in conflict. And it doesn't even make the news. 
And, and what I mean by dying, it, it, most of them are people who are dying of starvation because they've fled. Yeah, some of them are being killed by guns and machetes, but most are starving to death. That's actually how most people die in conflict. Peace, living at peace is the goal of all of the Old Testament and especially the New Testament. Living at peace with your fellow family member, your neighbor, and the fellow country next to you. In our faith, we become family with the whole world as Jesus as our center. Peace. So starting off by saying we want to have peace in our family because that will give us long life here on earth. Now, some in the health and wealth gospel will say things like, and this will make you rich. Well, there's some small truth to that. When you're at peace in your family, um, there's not conflict within the family. You have a better chance of working together if you have a family business when you're at peace and it going well. But much more important is you don't have the stresses of life. When you live with stress that's up to here, oh, your quality of life goes down and so does your health. Living at peace with your family. Now, honor your father and mother all sounds like common sense to us who grew up in families where we have good parents, a good mother and a father, but we all often forget who this was written to. This was predominantly written to people who had bad dads. Let me emphasize this. Roman culture enabled dads to be really bad, actually empowered them, and actually told them that that was the right thing to do. So what do you mean by being bad dads? Well, harsh. Um, They were harsh. What does it mean to honor your father and mother? It means to figure out culturally what, what makes them be perceived in the culture as, as, as loved. So, so let's talk about this harshness, though, first. Fathers were told that the only way that your child could succeed is by you being, treating them like your horse that you need to break. Again, there's actual training manuals that you can find online that equate how you train a horse is the way you should train a child. If you know anything about me preaching here, you'll know that I would often say that, that the whole idea of stoicism is one of the most dangerous ideas that, that show up in our culture. Okay, so what is stoicism again? Stoicism is, I am a self-made man, emphasis man, and I can help others, but I don't need any help. It sets me up here and others down there. It's an unrealistic expectation that only a very few select people can actually attain to. And even when you get there, you can't stay there very long. What's one of the worst things for a Stoic to have to receive? Help from others. Here's the truth. Every single one of us at some point in time will need help from others. So what does that mean? 100% of people who are Stoics will fail in Stoism. Now, that's the type of level of anxiety and pressure they were living under. We often know about Japanese culture where where somebody who's lost honor will kill themselves. Roman society was built on exactly this. We often read stories about the Stoic who's lost in a battle. And instead of surrendering, they'll kill themselves. That's not an honorable thing. This is the way that they trained and believed they needed to train their children. Now, Paul says, honor your father and mother. He's not saying, do whatever they tell you. What does honoring your father and mother mean? Well, if if they tell you to lie, murder, steal, well, then you don't do it. But you don't make a big deal about it. You don't tell everybody about it. This is actually, incidentally, why Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples saying, I have come and it will divide families. Jesus is saying, you know what? If your family is demanding things that God is saying don't do, then this will divide families. In a Greek and Roman culture, you had to listen to your parents all the time. But Paul doesn't say, do everything they say. He says, honor them. So what does it mean to honor? Listen to them. Don't belittle them. Don't put them down. Treat them with respect. 
Give them your time and your energy. In Canada, I think this means spend time with your parents. Eat with them. Celebrate your holidays. Remember this truth. Nobody naturally cares for children as much as parents do. That is a natural bent. This is true for believers and unbelievers alike. This is actually one of the ways we can witness to people and share about the good news of Jesus and show them what does this actually mean. It is rare for parents that don't care for their children. And even those who fail at it are deeply want to do better. You know, in all my years of pastoral ministry, I have never met, I know they exist because I've read about them, but I've never met in person a parent who doesn't care about their children. Now, they might have their priorities mixed up. They, they might not know how to show care, but I've never met one that actually doesn't care. Actually, how you show honor to your parents if you're a non-believer with non or you're a believer with non-believing parents is, is actually one of the greatest witnesses you can have to direct them towards Jesus Christ. When I was a youth pastor, I had youth from many non-believing families, especially when I was in Elmwood. And they came to faith and they asked for baptism. I told them, I'm so excited to baptize them. But if you're under 18, you need to have the blessing of your parents before we do this. And I remember the look of shock on a number of their faces. No, I, I, that's too hard. I don't want to ask them. You don't know my parents. They're so mean. They're so mean. They don't, they'll, they'll never give my permission. I said, hey, why don't we have coffee with them? Every single one of them was terrified. Actually, I was a little bit terrified too. Well, let's go. Every single one of them, even if the parents balked at the idea of baptism at first, every single one of them was thankful that they were asked. Matter of fact, honored that they were asked. Each situation played out differently, with some simply saying, thank you for asking me. When's baptism? I'll be there. To others saying, you know what? I need to check this out. I, I need to know more. That's not a bad thing, is it at all? Every single one of them ended up blessing their child to be baptized. A large portion of them actually ended up coming to the church and becoming believers themselves later on. The children, honoring their parents, leading them towards Christ. Greg Boyd, who is a professor of Anabaptist theology and a renowned pastor, published in 1994 his letters that he had between his father, who was an atheist, and who eventually chose to follow Jesus. The best description I can give of Greg Boyd's letters is honoring. Most notably, when his father sent letters back to him that weren't very kind. One of the most important ways to share the good news of Jesus Christ is with our families in an honoring way. And when it comes to parents, the concept of honoring is a posture that goes an incredibly long way that actually lays out to everything we do. I actually think it's not a coincidence in any way that, that the posture of honoring starts with our family and then goes on next to our jobs. Now, you might say slavery in a bit. Jobs, slavery, well, we'll talk about that very soon. The way our children also see us honoring our own parents teaches them what healthy relationships look like. One of the things I'm genuinely thankful for is how my parents respected their parents, my grandparents, very well. It's actually been an example for me as an adult who's now walking alongside parents with health problems in their late 70s. It is really summed up by Jesus' teaching, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. So the phrase, so it might go well with you and you might enjoy long life on earth is a blessing that is found all throughout the Old Testament, but specifically Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Following God's rules for living does not mean you'll become rich and wealthy, but you'll have peace. Peace. And this makes sense to come from the Prince of Peace. And statistics show that. It lines up. Healthy families help each other in hard times. Now, verse 4. These hard words for fathers. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction in the Lord. As I've said before, you've heard me talk about stoicism. This is a direct shot purposely shot across the bow of stoicism by Paul, who knew who and what he was talking to. When people talk about the patriarchy in our society, 
that they think they're talking about Christianity and the negative man-focused ruling over society, they actually don't realize its negative roots aren't from the Bible. It's, it's actually from Greek and Roman culture that we've allowed to come into the scriptures and into our faith and into our culture. Stoicism teaches that I can do it myself. The only reason why I occasionally, I can't listen to them very long because they drive me crazy. There's this guy named Andrew Tate and he keeps showing up on my feed all the time. I don't know why. I don't know why. But I listen to him occasionally. Is, is, is I need to know what he's saying to young men. He's just repackaging Roman stoicism for today. You don't need to help others. You, you don't need any help to the top. And if you do help others, you can look down on them. This even turns good deeds into something bad. Stoicism is all about stepping on the guy beneath you to get above you, ultimately, when you stop and think about it. It drives people to perfectionism that is no, not only unachievable, that, but, it, but it makes those who are around you exasperated, especially if you're demanding that from them as well. You need to be like this, and you can't even succeed in it yourself. And then you demand your son, because this is most likely talking fathers to son. You can't do that. You want a recipe for, for a disaster of a relationship? That's it. That, that did it. That's an exasperated child. What does it mean to be exasperated? Intensely irritated and frustrated, according to the dictionary. So how can this parent exasperate their child? By only giving them criticism. By only telling them when they've done something wrong. Never praising them for when they did it right. And if they do do what was right, they believe that they don't need to tell them that they did it right because they only need to be told what's there done wrong. That's a recipe to exasperate. Another is to simply ignore your child. We'll talk about favoritism in a few moments, but just think about this for a second. You, with stoicism, often focus on the one who's successful and you push them. And the one who's, ah, whatever, that middle child or that kid that's just whatever, you ignore them. You want to exasperate a child? Ignore them. Don't notice them unless they've done something either extraordinary or extraordinarily bad. You ever wonder why there's some kids that just misbehave? It's just to get your attention and to get their dad's attention. Instead, they're commanded to bring their children up in the training of the Lord. Here's the great news. Here's your, here's your, your, your job this week. Did you know that during the time of King Hezekiah, there is a, a book put together for the purpose of teaching young men, and I believe this applies to all genders now, but during the time of King Hezekiah, on what does it mean to be raised in the way of the Lord? Does anybody want to guess what that book is called? It was, it, was a, it was a textbook for schools, for boys. And that was the time where these schools were first invented was Hezekiah, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is written on how to train your children in the ways of the Lord. What does it mean to be training your children in the ways of the Lord? Well, the book of Proverbs sums it up great, but here's one that I want to give a shout out to my own father. My father taught me to be generous. Every year, and he did it practically, Every year from grade 6 to 12, I helped my dad at our Christmas break to deliver Christmas cheerboard hampers. Somehow, it was always minus 35 when we delivered them. Always. Never had to worry about the turkey thawing. That's to say that. We'd take our little black Mazda B2000 and drop off hampers. It was a great example of being trained in the Lord. The Bible, textbook, Proverbs teaches us so much. And remember though, Paul says there's neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, all are equal in God's eyes. The book of Proverbs applies to all of us. Now, there's a danger here for children that grew up in homes with the heavy hand of stoicism when it was wielded on them that they abdicate the role of parenting and they treat their child as a friend when they are still a child. Now, do we want to be friends with our children? Yes, actually, we absolutely do. That is actually what Emerson Edrick says that we want from our children when they're adults. We want to train our children in the way of the Lord so they become adults alongside us in family. But that balancing act is hard, and each situation for each child is different, but it's good that we get to do it in community. 
here's another good book that I recommend highly. That was huge for me in my own household. I, I mentioned it last week, Five Love Languages for Marriage, but there's a great book and there's a great series on it in the Right Now Media on Five Love Languages for Children. Teaching on which is the love language that your child needs to hear because raising your children in a home that is Christ-centered means that they feel and experience love. Whether that's words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, or physical touch. And each child has a principal love language that they feel the most loved by. And it's our job as parents to figure out what are those love languages they need to hear the most. Let's move into the second section that is culturally not part of a society here in Canada today so much. But there still is principles that apply to us as workers and, and bosses. Slaves with masters. First of all, slavery is inherently evil. One of the people, when we did prayer before we started the meeting, this, this Sunday morning service, when I said, well, I'm preaching on slavery, and without meaning to, they just pow- jumped out and said, don't do it. Don't be slave owners. Right, yes. Okay, but let's remember our idea of slavery comes out of the U.S. and the Americas, the, the Cuba, um, Haiti, uh, Brazil. They're all as guilty. It's not just America. That's the ones we see the movies on. This whole Western Hemisphere with colonialism of the last 250 years, slavery reached its peak of, of most dehumanizing and evil that humanity's ever seen. And we often feel think that slavery somehow came to an end in the brutal form it was after the American Civil War, but just stop and think about it. When was the worst period of slavery and dehumanization that humanity has ever seen in the last 2,000 years? World War II. And it was built on the same idea. It was actually based on racism. There are certain races that are inferior. They're not worth anything. They're, 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 they're half-breeds of, of animals and maybe demonic, and, and they deserve to die. That's actually where a lot of these ideas of how bad slavery got to. And it's actually based on, on a, a perverted interpretation of Darwin's survival of the fittest. Slavery in ancient Rome was brutal, but it was nothing like our modern times that we think of for slavery. Where did I get that from? PBS's documentary on slavery in the Roman Empire. Let me read to you a few things that PBS says about slavery in the Roman Empire in comparison to what we think of slavery in modern times. Most slaves during the Roman Empire were foreigners, and unlike modern times, Roman slavery was not based on race. All slaves and their, prop- and their families were the property of their owners who could rent, sell them at any time. Their lives were harsh. Slaves were often whipped, branded, and cruelly mistreated. Their owners could also kill them for any reason and face no punishment. Remember, this is who this was written to. Slaves worked everywhere, in private households, in mines, in factories, and on farms. They also worked for city governments, engineering projects such as roads and aqueducts and buildings. As a result, they merged into the population. In fact, slaves looked so familiar and similar to Roman citizens that the Senate once considered a plan to make them wear special clothing so you could identify that's a slave at first glance. But the idea was rejected by the Senate because the Senate feared that if slaves saw how many of them were working in Rome, they might be tempted to revolt. Another difference between Roman slavery and modern variety was the ability for slaves to be freed. It was actually very common for Roman slaves to be freed by good masters. It's estimated that over 50% of slaves were freed before the age of 50. Roman owners freed slaves in considerable numbers. Some were freed right outright. Others were allowed to buy their freedom. And the prospect, get this, this is important, the prospect of possible freedom encouraged most slaves to be obedient and hardworking because so many were freed. So take this into consideration. I didn't know this till I studied this this last week. One of the reasons why Paul is telling them, be good, obedient, following God, slaves, because everybody already understood. You have a reasonable chance, over 50% chance of being freed so that's an important thing to make note of. 
Also, I want to point out that the teachings on slavery from the Old Testament were something completely different yet. Again, not perfect. It, it was a, we could see lots of problems of Old Testament society that we would not want to apply here today in Canada in 2024. Um, I don't want to go back to kosher diet for me, okay? But slavery, did you know this? If the Jews actually followed the laws of God for slavery, there would be no slaves that were slaves for more than six years. That was actually commanded not once, but three times in the books of Moses and multiple times reminded in the prophets. If you had a slave, they could be slave for six years maximum. And then at the end of the six years, they're given two options. They're given a three-month severance. Get that? Three months. Who gets a three-month severance after working at a place for six years? Very few. A three-month severance. Now, they did work for free during that time, other than just being fed and housed. Or they're given the option of, say, uh, and, they, and they get to choose, of becoming a lifelong servant that is a member of the household. Remember that. Becoming a member of the household. Going from being a slave to a member of the household. Okay? That's what people were looking at in the Old Testament. Now, unfortunately, that was almost never followed. Does anybody want to guess why? because those in power like to stay in power and they don't like to follow the rules that don't line up with what they like. Even if it's clear in the Word of God, because it's not one obscure passage, it's there three times almost identical in the law of God. So if God says it three times, you know he's taking this seriously, right? So, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. Take this in consideration, what we just learned. With sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win the favor with their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are free or slave. Paul was teaching that the real freedom that we can all find is when you realize whatever you do, you're actually working for God, not the person. Remember, these slaves were trying to win the favor of their masters because they hoped to be set free, which was a real possibility. Paul says that is a good goal. You should go for that. But there's so much more to it. Be the person they can be relied on. Work in a way that your reputation as a follower of Jesus will be noticed. Again, in no way is Paul saying, do anything that would go against the teachings and commandments of God. Do not lie, cheat, murder, or steal. But I think verse 5 sums it up best. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect. Respect. You can tell from two miles away when you're being respected or disrespected. God, when he changes our motives, enables us to show respect even to people who don't deserve our respect. Slaves, obey your earthly bosses and look to your heavenly master for your purpose. Now, Paul is not saying to go against God's laws, but he is giving us the purpose, the real freedom that we get when we follow God, which is value and purpose and meaning. In God's kingdom, there are no menial jobs. That is exactly why Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He took on the lowliest task. He saw and noticed the people who were doing the most menial jobs and blessed them. Ours and every other society that has ever existed cannot run without people doing the cooking and cleaning, the painting and paving, the picking up garbage and making sure the water and sewer runs. Who's the most invisible person in our society? Who's the most invisible? The custodian. Well, actually, they're not invisible if they didn't do their job, right? Right? Then you notice them. Oh, I can't believe they missed that strip on the vacuum. Or or the bathroom is disgusting. Or everybody notices when they don't do their job and nobody notices when they do. I try to make it a habit to thank every custodian I meet. Our, our, we have a wonderful custodian that comes into our church. He's from the Eritrean congregation, our, our brother in Christ. Every time I'm in on Saturday, I make sure I have coffee with him and I visit with him. And he always tells me Eritrean coffee is better than this. And I'm like, I am, I, yes, I'm drinking Maxwell House. Everything's better than this. Sorry if you're a Maxwell House drinker. 
I try to make sure I notice him every time. Why? He's a wonderful man. He's got incredible stories of him uh, surviving warfare and living in a country with peace. How do I know? Because I ask him. I make it a habit of whenever I meet a custodian in a place like Calgary Airport, I see them in the bathroom. I always look them in the eye, because that's a huge son, and I say, thank you. And they look at me like, thank you for what? I said, well, for cleaning. And then they smile. Every time I go to an airport in the bathroom, I thank the person that's cleaning. Making simple, direct eye contact and thanking people goes a long way in showing respect. Verse 9. Oh, mine. Okay, I'll wrap this up real soon. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that it is he who is both their master and is your master in heaven. And there's no favoritism in him. That's my last thing I want to say. There is no favoritism with him. Wow, what a great verse to leave off with. Favoritism does more to damage our family and workplace than any showing of anything else. Think about it. Joseph and his family. Why was there anguish in that family? It was favoritism that was shown by his father to the favorite son. Joseph's relationship with his brothers was forever tainted. Even though God brought healing, it was still forever tainted. Look at the end of his life. They were still worried that now that Jacob was gone, that that Joseph might do something to them. Forever that relationship was tainted. Loving means finding fairness in our homes first and foremost. Showing favoritism towards a child, whether it's gender or or, or skill set or personality, is cancer in the home, and it cuts both ways. It it, it can actually make a a child feel that they're over the others. It can also cause the ones who aren't being shown favoritism great resentment. What do we want in our homes? Peace. This is like the worst thing we can do for peace. Fairness. I, I, I know that Heather and I are not perfectly fair, but I can guarantee you we pray about it and we talk about it on a regular basis. How are we fair with our children? And, and meaning it. Like, not just like, oh, fine, we have to do this. Like, we want this. Why? Because we, we want to raise our children so that they will succeed and have a good, peaceful life with our family And that can apply to their own family. Do we fail at this? Yes. What happens when you fail at something? You apologize. That's really hard for stoic men like me to do. But the number one thing that turns children off from following the Lord is saying, my parents are hypocrites. The only answer, because we are, we are all hypocrites. The only answer is this. When it's pointed out that we are hypocrites, we accept it, we apologize for it, and we strive to do something about it. Does that mean we're going to have success and we're going we're to do it right the next time and never again wrong? No. But fairness is one of those huge things that we need to do. And this applies to us as bosses. Think of the people who line up to work in places that are fair. Now, we live in this weirdest time economically where we are actually having a hard time finding workers at our workplace. You want to know, want a, want a, want a little task on, on how to get workers and keep them? Be fair. Whether it's fair with wages and, and, and not choosing others over in an unfair way. Treating your employees fair makes you want to stay. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and I'm going to conclude with one last story. One of the things that made my heart have joy. On the way home from Yellowknife last week, I was sitting with an older couple who had gone to visit their, ch- their, their daughter and their, and their son-in-law in Yellowknife, just like we did. And I said, oh, what, what does your daughter and son do? She says, my, my, son is an air, my son-in-law works for Air Tindy. And I'm like, oh, my daughter-in-law just started working for there. Yeah, they went up there for six months. Now, 17 years later, we're still here. I'm like, wow, that's great. Why is that? Because they just said, what a great place to work. Oh, you don't know what makes a dad's heart sore better than that. That is witness for Jesus Christ as followers of Christ. So go there and show no favoritism. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we have a tall task 
but we have you as our example. And our example is held by others around us who have success and failings. And we as a church are called to, to teach and hold each other up. Lord, let us not be discouraged by these, these tall tasks, knowing that you show no favoritism either by who's better or who's worse at these. That we're called in a life of discipleship to take one step forward following your lead and bringing peace to those around us, starting in our family and going on to all the rest of the world, including our employees and fellow employee, employers around us. In Jesus' name, amen.